Shackleton was a contemporary of, of, of Scott and Amundsen. Scott and Amundsen, of course, had vied to be the first to the pole. Scott got there narrowly after Amundsen, of course, died along with all of his men on the attempted return. And, and Amundsen was lauded as the great hero, and Scott a great hero too for having made the ultimate sacrifice. But Shackleton had decided to do one better, which was to cross the whole of the Antarctic with the pole just being midway. And when he didn't manage to land his ship because it was crushed, he then undertook a journey, ironically, that was far more challenging, far more challenging than the original would have been. I can say that because I've crossed Antarctica on foot on the journey that he originally intended to do, and I got almost all the way to the other side before a fuel leak uh, ruined my chances of doing the whole thing. And no one has ever done it to this day, the whole crossing. But I think it was within my physical wherewithal to do it. But the journey that we've just done, that he was forced to do and we've just replicated was a far more difficult undertaking. And so in, you know, he's a showman. In typical fashion, he set out to do one thing and the thing he ended up doing was just so much more than even he could have possibly imagined. And he saved everybody. As soon as you scratch the surface of this polar world, you realise that he is regarded as the greatest bar none. Not only was it life-threatening and desperate and miserable, but it was boring and it was challenging and it was over such an extended period. It took a year for the boat to sink and they were out on the ice for four months. And then they paddled across 50 miles of open ocean to them four days, you know, against currents that were going the wrong way. And, and then he had to leave 22 men on the island and they were thinking, we may never be rescued. Why should we work together? It's a recipe to take from the other and instead they hold together. Every element of the journey required skills that none of the other polar explorers possess. This ability to identify with everybody, understand their motivations, be compassionate towards them when they needed to be, firm when they needed to be, fun when they needed to be, you know, optimistic. It's the, the greatest survival journey of all time, I've no doubt about that. The expedition is retracing Ernest Shackleton's journey of survival that he undertook in 1916. We've got two round-the-world sailors. One's an Aussie called Paul Larson. He's number two to a skipper called Nick Bubb. Then there's the head of outdoor survival for the Royal Marines, a guy called Barry Gray. Uh, there's another guy from the Royal Navy called Seb Coulthard, who's done a lot of the retrofitting of the boat. And then the final guy is the cameraman, and he has summited Everest twice and used to be the UK free diving champion. We've trialled our little boat in the roughest conditions we could find. It was a boat without a keel, 100-year-old uh, technology, and they were only in it out of desperation. It was the lifeboat, essentially. For six men, it's, it's hopeless. The, the living area below is about the size of a dining table. It's a very, very cramped, very, very rough ride. It's like a washing machine. We'll take it down and we'll do some sea trialling when we get to Antarctica before we set off on the expedition. We're going to try and this is a glacier snout here. I must say four years into the planning of this which is what these things normally take and I'm really ready to just go and do it uh, rather than continue to try and research it and plan it. Stand by guys to row normally. Okay, okay, let's right. go. Okay, and punting off. Right, 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 right. Hold on, chaps. Hey! <laughs> Hold on, Paul. After day one, you've already had enough. You know, you have absolutely zero personal space. You know, we waterproofed these very primitive cotton outer layers, which are designed really to keep the wind off as best we could with dubbing and fat and grease and that sort of stuff. First wave came in. I was drenched, you know, and the four woolen layers I had on underneath that layer were then wet for the rest of the trip. And you're lying there trying to, trying to get body heat from, your, from yourself to dry your own clothes and from the others you're lying in amongst. And you open the hatch to get on deck and there's a storm. And the temperature is two degrees, one degree, minus two, and the wind is blowing at 50 knots and the seas are 30 foot. And it's like being handed the wheel of a car, having been asleep in the passenger seat, and said, you know, you take over when you're in the middle of a controlled skid. You know, you're in these dark valleys looking up, hoping these waves will not break on you or tip you over. You know, it's really a terrifying experience, particularly for a non-sailor. 
but even for the sailors, they were thinking, wow, you know. Um, so we had storms for three or four days out of 11, which is a lot when you're in amongst it and you have no respite. And when we arrived at South Georgia, ironically, instead of the big storm that Shackleton had the day he got there, we had mist, which actually is almost equally bad because if you, if you still have big seas pushing you towards the rocky outline of the island, you can hear the breakers, but you can't see it in the mist. You, know, you spend all this time trying to get to South Georgia and suddenly you just do not want to be there. You, know, you want to be as far away as possible. We were calm and determined about it. Or I mean, there are moments of panic, don't get me wrong, but generally speaking, the big decisions were, were made with a level head. You know, you just can't mess around. We got the boat journey in the replica James Kerr. These are traditional navigation, traditional clothing, and traditional everything. It's, uh, it's a moment. I wouldn't say the climb is more difficult than the ocean. I just say that we grossly underestimated the climb and it came back to really bite us, you know, really bite us. Well, the climb, the climb was fantastic in one respect and it was great to just get moving, um, but it rapidly descended into serious problems and major doubts about whether we would even do it because two people then had to be pulled out, a third one dropped out, and so it was great to leave, break camp and get moving, followed within five hours of being drenched, absolutely wet through, and being forced to evacuate a couple of the people. We completely underestimated. We'd already been doing high fives and celebrating when we got to the end, to the top of the mountains of what they call Breakwind Ridge. Breakwind Ridge is one of those wonderfully, inappropriately named by an Edwardian um, serious mountain ranges. It's like vertical ice climbing with, with crappy gear and uh, I had three hobnails on one boot and five on the other and an old carpenter's ad but I was using that and hemp rope and these terrible hobnails to descend a 75 degree slope you know we were climbing down on our hands looking over our shoulders thinking we'd have fall off this um, for the first three or four hundred meters. We got to the Koenig Glacier for us, it wasn't a glacier anymore, it was meltwater. But this is freezing cold, fast running, waist deep in places, just water running out to the sea. You know, we were faced with an impassable barrier of this stuff. In the end, we thought it'd be blown, we just have to wade through it. And again, the boots just turned to pulp. And, you know, every single stage was a, was a problem and another hurdle to jump through. So when we finally got there, you know, even the final six miles into the, into the thing, again, my feet were so bruised by the hobnails walking on rocks. You know, you walk in there and it's just absolute relief to take the final steps. You know. Bring it on. I'm not good at that. Awesome, absolutely awesome. Chuffed a bit, really, really chuffed a bit. Uh, plenty of other people have tried. No one's done it yet. Nobody's done it. Until now. I kept walking throughout wilderness and thinking for them to do it the first time when no one had crossed that mountain. It's just unbelievable. The old, the old guys were iron men in their wooden boats, and, and this proves that uh, modern man can do the same thing. You know, we may travel in our iron boats, but we can still muster the endurance and the courage and the perseverance to pull something like this off. And, uh, it's a tribute to everybody involved. I think it's as close to what he went through as you can do. I'm confident no one will get closer because we've assembled a team people who are the right caliber to do this many have tried really many have tried and all have failed you know the only people who've been even moderately successful have had to just change the journey out of sight in order to do it in other words travel in a boat that's nothing like the original wear modern clothes be towed into south georgia have rest days and even we haven't done what he did i don't think there'd be any motivation for anybody else to try this because we've got as close as you possibly can without anybody being left behind on elephant island and you know, sinking a perfectly good ship. You know, environmentally, you know, warming is evident, very, very evident in the western part of the Antarctic, and that's basically where we started, Elephant Island. The glaciers there are retreating, very evidently. From old photos, you can see the extent to which they've retreated. When you reach South Georgia, you know, 
are 160 named glaciers on South Georgia, the big island. Every single one is in retreat. When we reach King Harkin Bay, the bay in which we landed the boat, all of them are hanging hundreds and hundreds of metres up now. Uh, we just waterfalls pour, pouring off all of them. For me, Shackleton's key message was people putting aside differences, pulling together, achieving the goal against, against the very, very difficult odds. And I think that's a very relevant message for the world. Shackleton was all about just action. He, he didn't talk about doing expeditions, he just did them. I have a thing called Do Tank. I think it's about not talking about doing things, it's about doing things, setting a positive example. That's leadership, isn't it? And people following, if they feel the example is worthy of following, and or contributing towards it, and you, you move agendas forward. I think we need far more action-oriented, Shackletonian-style responses to some of the issues we're facing, rather than just talking about it all the time and hypothesising about what we might do.